attacking the city. I've got a score to settle. This week saw two high-profile DLCs launch onto video game consoles and personal computers around the globe. The first one let you play as Lando fricking Calrissian in Star Wars Battlefront, something that fans had been waiting for since the game was released, while the second one, well, that allowed people to construct their very own personal Preston Garvey torture chambers in Fallout 4, which, to be fair, is something fans had been wishing for for a very, very long time indeed. I've gotten word that one of our settlements is... Yep, the Contraptions Workshop DLC for Fallout 4 really is a beautiful thing to behold. Anyway, long story short, this got us thinking about our favourite ever chunks of downloadable content. So sit back, relax and prepare to disagree as we run through our top 7 DLCs. Naughty Dog's fungus-filled survival horror rewrote the book on emotional storytelling and video games. Joel and Ellie's emotional journey from the quarantine zones of Boston to that ending in Utah ranks as one of the best video game tales of all time. And I'm not ashamed to admit feeling a lump in my throat on a couple of occasions. Such was the power of its writing. Left Behind continues that trend of beautifully written characters and subtle but affecting emotional scenes. It focuses solely on Ellie and her relationship with her best friend Riley. Split into two parts, Left Behind serves not only as a prequel to the events of the main game, but it also plugs some gaps from later on in the story, filling us in on what happened after Ellie and a severely injured Joel leave the university. It's only a short campaign, clocking in at around three hours long, but it's full of tense standoffs and a couple of genuinely touching scenes that will stick with you long after you've finished playing. Enter a brave new world. World Congress and Diplomacy. Civ 5 at release was a good video game. It reviewed well, it sold well, people generally quite liked it. But the thing is, when we talk about it today, we almost always end up talking about how its two expansion packs, Gods and Kings and Brave New World, transformed it into something much, much better. Civ 5 on its own is a good game, it still is, but Civ 5 with these two expansions installed becomes a great one. And that's because the changes they've introduced are not insignificant. We're talking about espionage, reworked combat, a whole host of new civilizations and wonders, a new trading system, cultural victories that are actually finally interesting thanks to tourism and archaeology. With these expansions installed you can host a world congress or decide upon your nation's religious beliefs. This is still the base game, but it's so much more. Actually, whilst we're on this topic, the fellow that led development on Gods and Kings and Brave New World is called Ed Beach, and he's now taking the reins on Civilization VI, the next numbered game in the series, which bodes extremely well. I interviewed him the other day, and you can watch that if you like. And oh man, I'm shilling my videos in the middle of the Eurogamer show. What a prick. There's nothing worse than boring, unimaginative DLC, and thankfully the Shivering Isles, the first and only proper expansion for Oblivion, was neither of those things. Accessible through a portal that appears in Nibbon Bay, the Shivering Isles are divided into two halves, with the northernmost region named Mania and the southern region Dementia. Each half has its own unique look, with mania full of crazy colours and strange exotic plant life, while dementia on the other hand was a dark and gloomy land full of foreboding locations. With a map roughly a third of the size of Cyrodiil, there was plenty of exploration to be had, and the abstract scenery and wacky quest lines added a much needed touch of personality to a game which, at the best of times, could be rather dry and devoid of humour. The star of the show though, and the real reason why we love this DLC so much, was the charismatic ruler of the Shivering Isles, Shia Gorath, the Daedric Prince of Madness. His hilarious rants never failed to raise a smile, and I'll always remember what happened the first time I tried to attack him. You really shouldn't have done that. Enjoy the... Oh, and of course, anyone who loves cheese as much as this guy is all right in our books. Cheese for everyone! Sam, the land of love and wine. Exactly how I remembered it. 
The Witcher 3 Blood and Wine gives you your very own vineyard to do up while hunting a terrifying beast, and it's sodding excellent. Set in the glorious region of Tucson, a land of pompous knights, glorious scenery and gross additions to The Witcher 3's bestiary, it's a cheerful counterpart to The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, which could, at times, be a little bit on the grim side. With some really, really weird side quests, it's clear CD Projekt Red decided to have a little bit of fun with Geralt's last outing. So if you like silly chivalric types in tournament armour and looking for the missing nuts from famous statues, step right this way. It won't take long. A few snips of the flesh here and here. Cut away everything vulgar. Look at my face. Can you see the horror there? The disbelief? That's the face of a man who can't quite believe what he's watching. That's the face of a man who's just about to watch someone's junk get cut in half by a circular saw. Oh, my word. Outlast was scary enough on its own, a tense survival horror game that was one part video game and one part endurance test. But Outlast Whistleblower, well, that was something else entirely. It took what was already one of the most horrifically twisted video games in existence and made it look like Barbie's horse adventures in comparison. Arguably even better than the base game, thanks to some high production values and great pacing, Whistleblower provided those brave enough to play it with a lengthy story that not only served as a prequel to the main campaign, but also filled in some of the gaps at the end as well. The jewel in the crown of the DLC, though, has to be the main villain, the Groom, easily one of the most memorable bad guys in the history of video games. The Groom loved nothing more than turning his male prisoners into his brides by removing their penises while they were still alive, and then murdering them in increasingly brutal ways. Boy, what a charmer. <laughs> If you played Outlast but haven't managed to touch this yet, you really need to give it a go. But be warned, you might need to have a little bit of quiet time once it's all over. <laughs> oh my word! Grand Theft Auto 4 had not one, but two excellent downloadable campaigns that together were known as Episodes from Liberty City. The first DLC, called The Lost and the Damned, starred a cranky biker named Johnny Klebitz, whose main aim in life was to keep his biker chapter, The Lost MC, from going the way of the dodo. It wasn't easy though, and internal conflicts, rival gang wars and drug problems were just a few of the things that threatened to put an end to his chosen way of life. The second DLC though, The Ballad of Gay Tony, was even better than The Lost and the Damned and put players in control of Luis Lopez, bodyguard to the titular Gay Tony. Not only did Ballad add a bunch of new vehicles, radio stations and weapons to the game, but it also brought a sense of frivolous fun back to the series, something that had been sorely missed in Nico's adventures in GTA 4. I somehow lost my patch! Mario Kart 8 really is a thing of beauty. Incredible graphics that burst with personality, 60 frames per second gameplay that just won't quit, and a soundtrack that can bring tears to the eyes. I mean, who wouldn't want more of that? Luckily for us, Nintendo was on its A-game with the DLC for MK8, and released not one but two content packs that were just as polished as the main game. Crammed with 8 tracks each, some brand new vehicles and a bunch of cool character cameos, Mario Kart 8's DLC packs were premium additions to the game that added untold hours to its lifespan. If you own Mario Kart 8 and didn't shell out for the DLC, then you are doing yourself a serious disservice, especially seeing as this is the closest we'll come to a brand new F-Zero game anytime soon. So those were the 8 video game add-ons that downloaded love into our hearts. But do you agree or do you think our opinion should be carved up and sold off as microtransactions? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more from Eurogamer. Bye!